On this episode of A Tale from the Dark Side, we will be covering one of the most dreaded, infamous, and ruthless gangsters in British history. A cold-blooded killer who was once frequently employed by Mike Tyson, a former world champion boxer, during his prime. Stay tuned, as we unravel the full story. Grab a snack, something to drink, and settle down, because this is going to be a bumpy ride. He goes by the name of none other than Gary Nelson, who is also popularly known as Tyson, due to his similarity and resemblance to the boxing champion of the world. Gary Nelson was born in Britain in 1969, and due to his cruel actions, his name became very well known throughout the nation. He was even once described by police as the most dangerous man in London. Nelson, who spent the majority of his time on the Winstanley estate in Battersea in South London, had a violent history which included 21 offences which date back to his adolescent years. Outsiders speculated that Nelson may have chosen this career route merely out of peer pressure, or out of a desire to feel invincible, which is how he was afterwards portrayed as, given his connections to one of London's most notorious criminal families at the time. In the criminal underworld, Nelson was very well regarded. In fact, the very well-known music artist DVS, who was cleared of murder in 2007, and is currently in prison after receiving a 23-year term for kidnap and torture, recorded a famous track where Nelson's name is respectfully referred to in the opener. The track is entitled, Hometown, and was released in 2011 on his album, which was named One in a Billion. DVS, whose real name is Courtney Hutchinson, is on the phone to Zartash Khan, which is known to be a close friend whom DVS refers to as his brother, and is reported to be a long-term acquaintance. Yo, salamu alaikum, my brother. What's good? Uh, what's going on? Uh, who am I chatting to? Straight. At the time of this phone call, Zartash Khan, a notorious and brutal mobster of Pakistani heritage, is serving a 22-year prison sentence in a high-security prison called HMP Whitemore for shooting a police officer when he was only 20 years old. When Mike Tyson travelled to the UK in the year 2000, for his notorious match-up with Lewis, he recruited Nelson as close protection. After learning about Nelson's reputation for being a terrifying person, Mike had specifically requested that Nelson protect him. Nelson encouraged Mike to spend a significant amount of money at this time, to purchase a considerable selection of jewellery for £2 million, as a gesture of goodwill. Given that Nelson had previously shielded Tyson during prior battles, such as his fight with Julius Francis in Manchester the same year. Many rumours have persisted over the years, claiming that Nelson gained the upper hand in this situation and even went so far as to take the world champion boxer by the neck and scream at him, with forceful aggression. However, numerous underworld sources have continuously debunked these reports. Like, who in their right mind could possibly step out of line with Prime Iron Mike and survive to tell the tale, regardless of how powerful and vicious the gangster is? According to the records, Nelson had delegated the task of buying this jewellery to Frank Warren, who was at the time his promoter. The fact that the bill was not ultimately paid caused a horrible friction between Mike and Warren. This led to Mike striking Warren in a hotel room, leaving him with a bloody eye, according to the evidence. A story which continues to make headlines today. Infatuated with guns, Nelson called his Browning 9mm semi-automatic pistol, My Special Thing. With a violent record stretching back to his early teens and links to one of London's most infamous crime families, he accumulated a fortune, which he spent on a luxury apartment, top-of-the-range cars and designer clothes. He was a hitman but he was so much more than that, said a Scotland Yard source. 
Hitmen are at the bottom of the criminal food chain, taking the orders. Nelson was at the very top, giving them. He killed whoever he wanted or arranged to have them killed. On the 20th of October 1993, a man by the name of William Danso, who was a doorman at the Brixton Academy venue, in South London, was targeted and killed by Nelson and two unidentified accomplices. Woolwich Crown Court heard that Nelson and two of his accomplices laughed as they fired a hail of bullets at Danso in his hallway in Cato Road, Clapham. By chance, P.C. Dunn, a 44-year-old former math teacher who had joined the police four years prior, rode up on his bicycle to handle a minor domestic disturbance at the home across the street. Nelson, who was holding the tanfolio, fired a single shot into P.C. Dunn's chest, killing him instantly, as he ran into the street after hearing gunfire. P.C. Dunn was known as Dixon of Doc Green because of his cordial demeanor. Witnesses say they heard the trio laugh and fire a celebratory shot in the air as they walked to a waiting car. The court was informed that Nelson had targeted Danso because of the way in which Danso had previously treated Nelson, by refusing to let him enter a nightclub. Reliable underworld sources, however, claim that this is untrue and that Danso's murder by Nelson was actually motivated by a tardy payment of a sizable amount of drugs, to which Nelson had earlier assigned him. In the underworld, paying late is seen as a huge sign of contempt. Five weeks after the killings, Nelson was initially charged with both murders. However, the case was later dismissed for lack of sufficient proof. Strangely enough, the guns were allegedly buried in Wandsworth Cemetery nearby Nelson's home at the time. Sir Nelson's own aunt, Rose Nelson, led a party of women on a strange, overnight excursion to find them. They were unable to locate the weapons, but five months later, authorities discovered them after receiving anonymous phone calls from one of the ladies and seeing lipstick crosses on the gravestones. During the investigation, it was revealed that Norman Fallows, a former police driver, and Burnmore Lindop, a gangland supergrass, had both been found guilty of possessing firearms. On March 1994, police raided Lindop's yard in Dagenham, East London. Later, at the Old Bailey, Lindop and his companion, retired police driver Norman Fallows, admitted to having 10 illicit guns. However, court records state that the pair were found in possession of far more. Although Fallows, 51, had 44 boxes of ammunition, telescopic sights, silencers, and assault weapons, he was only given a 15-month prison term despite fearing a lengthy sentence. According to the papers, he also led investigators to three Smith & Wesson revolvers and a semi-automatic pistol that were hidden in a stream in East London's Hainaut Country Park. Lindop, then 46, had a loaded handgun in his pocket when he was arrested. Three revolvers, three shotguns, three pistols, 11 assault rifles, and 3,451 rounds of ammo were also present at his residence. Additionally, he possessed body armor, silencers, and telescopic sights, all preferred equipment of a hitman in his prime. However, upon jailing Lindop and Fallows, after being briefed by police, Judge Neil Dennison said neither of the men intended to supply criminals. According to documents obtained from a source, top officials at Scotland Yard gave Lindop, a former doorman and convicted armed robber, permission to take part in police sting operations against narcotics groups within London and Liverpool. A third man, Sidney Wink, a former police dog handler's three-bedroom home in Ilford, East London, was raided by the Flying Squad in July 1994, four months after Lindop was taken into custody. When police arrived at the scene at 5.30 a.m., his tea was still steaming, but Wink was nowhere to be seen. A few days later, right before he was to be questioned, he shot himself in the head in an alleyway. According to police, Wink was a part of a scheme in which illicit firearms were rendered, inoperable, then officially registered, before Lindop, via a third person, reactivated them and sold them on the black market.
His house was full of deactivated, reactivated firearms. It was an arsenal, said a senior former flying squad detective. Wink, who was 66 years old, had been selling firearms for 18 years, since he left the Met in 1975 after 25 years of service. In 1994, a police spokesman refuted claims that he had provided the weapons used to assassinate P.C. Dunn. Yet, according to five sources, including three former police officers, the Mirror has received confirmation that he was involved. One claimed that due to particular markings left by a tool Wink used to erase serial numbers, it was recognized that he had altered the tanfolio which was used in murder and recovered. The source said, there was a mechanical fit between a punch recovered from Wink's workshop and the gun. At least 270 firearms were said to have been reactivated by Wink, 150 of which ended up in the hands of criminals. He had left a suicide note for his wife, which stated, I am very sorry for what I have done. Eight years later, at the age of 55, Lindock was assassinated outside his home in Goodmays, East London. As he exited his Black M Reg Range Rover Discovery, he was shot four times, including in the head and jaw. A case which still hasn't been solved until this day. I'm quite confident you can all read between the lines. Despite everything which took place, there was still not enough evidence to charge Nelson, who was soon back in jail for a road rage incident in 1994. Nelson received an eight-year sentence for a shooting. He had become irate after a van driver attempted to pass him on a South London street. When the argument over the road rage escalated, Nelson got out of his car and fired five shots at the van, striking the bonnet and radiator in the process. According to Underworld sources, even from his prison cell, Nelson continued to strike dread into the hearts of everyone he knew. Nelson rushed nude from his cell and lunged at guards with a broom handle 10 days after beginning his sentence at Belmarsh High Security Prison in southeast London. Nelson allegedly once managed to escape from a straitjacket and frightened some of the nation's most notorious criminals into giving him phone credits so he could call his numerous lovers. Nelson was quickly back in the criminal underworld of South London after being released from prison in 1999. After a month-long surveillance operation, conducted in February 2003 which was not linked to Cato Road, Nelson was followed to the United States, where he bought a laser device for a 9mm Browning semi-automatic. In January 2004, Nelson was sentenced to life in prison for possessing firearms, when officers burst in and discovered a Browning 9mm complete with laser sight, a silencer and ammunition for a second weapon. Soon after, things started to slowly unravel. A former co-detainee in Wormwood Scrubs who claimed that Nelson told him in 1994, I shot the copper, the one on the bike, was brought forward as a result of a BBC Crime Watch appeal, after the Cato Road case was first reviewed in 2001, in part as a result of pressure from the Dunn family. Sandra Francis, the lady who called the police about the guns due to her Christian faith, was also located and willing to testify. Even further, investigators traveled all the way to Ghana in order to track down Eugene Jarba, the manager of a store where Danso had previously worked. In 1996, Jarba jumped bail and fled. He was later found guilty of a £3 million cigarette fraud when he was not present. In a highly unprecedented move, he testified via video link with regards to witnessing Nelson withdraw a revolver from his jacket the day before the killings and threatened to put a bullet in the belly of another man. He later identified the gun as the Tanfolio. Nelson was never identified during an identity parade and there was no conclusive forensic evidence. However, the prosecutor, Richard Horwell QC, based his case on 13 planks of circumstantial evidence, according to which Nelson was on Cato Road and the Tanfolio was in his possession. DCI Richardson described Nelson's attitude during police interviews as nonchalant, 
but as Mr. Horwell told the jury, arrogance and notions of invincibility sometimes go before a fall. It looks like the mystery finally came to an end. On February the 17th in 2006, Gary Lloyd Nelson, who was 36 at the time, was convicted of two charges of murder and handed two concurrent life sentences with the suggestion that he must serve at least 35 years, which he is still currently serving. Deborah, the widow of Mr. Danso, and Gifty, his sister, sobbed when Nelson was found guilty by the jury. Detective Chief Inspector Richardson said, the murders of William Danso and Patrick Dunn were cold-blooded executions carried out by extremely dangerous men, for virtually no reason. Five children have had to grow up without their father because arrogant men felt he had not shown him enough respect. Clapham lost a dedicated community officer and PC Dunn's family lost a son and brother, because courageously he went to investigate on hearing gunfire. I am pleased that one of those murderers has been brought to justice. The family of PC Dunn said they were ecstatic, the callous moral coward who killed him has been jailed for life. I'm absolutely ecstatic. We have been waiting 12 and a half years. It really has been an enormous weight which has now been lifted off of our shoulders, Ivan Dunn, the office's brother said. Unlike his brother, Steve, who had forgiven Nelson for the killing, Ivan said he would hate him forever. Sincere sympathies, condolences and best wishes to all victims in this case. We pray you are granted the patience you so well deserve. And until next time, please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment and share.